Hello everyone, Father Dr. Stell here. By popular demand, and as promised, I would like to talk to you today about the eclipse. Actually, not about the astronomical phenomenon we experienced this past Monday, April 8th, but about the term eclipse, its etymological origins, and its deeper meaning. In fact, as I alluded to in my Facebook post, the Greek word eclipsis possesses a most interesting provenance. Its linguistic, biblical, and theological significance are equally intriguing. The word eclipse comes from the ancient Greek verb eklipo, which, in very general terms, can best be understood in the sense of lack, deprivation, or absence. There are several definitions which I will provide for the present active infinitive form, eklipin. For example, it can mean, one, to leave out or to pass over, two, to forsake, to desert, to abandon, three, to leave off, to cease, four, to fail, to be wanting, to be inferior, five, to fail someone, six, to die, to die off in the sense of disappearing gradually, or to die out in the sense of becoming endangered and eventually extinct, seven, to faint, eight, to depart, nine, to be left, to remain, and finally, ten, to be eclipsed in astronomical terms. While the nuanced meanings are dependent on the specific context in which the word is used, the implication is clear. It conveys the notion that something or someone is not whole or complete. In other words, something is missing. It is quite interesting that only after the epoch of the great Athenian historian and military general Thucydides, or Thucydides, who lived roughly around 460 to 400 BC, the famous author of the history of the Peloponnesian War, the term eclipse, eclipsis, began to be used for the failure or eclipse of the light from the sun or the moon as we understand it today. The failure, however, was not the fault of either celestial body being inherently incapable of transmitting its own illumination. In other words, there was nothing defective about the sun or moon. The failure could be understood, rather, because of a hindrance, an impediment, an obstruction. In the case of a solar eclipse, the sun's rays are temporarily blocked out from a given location on the Earth because the moon gets in the way and limits the natural sunlight to which living beings are accustomed. In the case of a lunar eclipse, the Earth's shadow passes in front of the moon and begins to limit the moonlight that our closest natural satellite casts upon the Earth. Therefore, an eclipse in antiquity was perceived as an extraordinary, that is, out of the ordinary and rare event, an anomaly of sorts that inspired fear and confusion among people precisely because it was inexplicable. Prior to this application to an astronomical phenomenon, the verb was originally understood as referring to the departure of light, which was akin to the departure from life, that is, death. Inversely, to cast one into darkness, or to be cast into darkness, meant to enter into the realm of death, or non-existence. Thus, the modern Greek word skotorno, which means I kill or I destroy, essentially means I cast into darkness, or I make darkness come over someone or something 
with the ancient Greek word for darkness being skotos. In the Gospel of St. John, Christ, the Logos of God, is understood as being the very source of life. This does not mean that the force of life is in him, enafto zoiin, as if the force is superior to him and animates him, but that he is life itself, in whom St. Paul assures the Athenians that the Christians live in him and move and have their being. And afto zomen ke kinumetha ke ismen, as we read in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 28. In other words, the followers of Christ, by virtue of our holy illumination at baptism and chrismation, have become as one light with him, projecting to the world his grace and truth as the rays of the sun flow from their own source, the sun. The evangelist John goes on to profess that Christ, the true life, was the light of men. Thus equating the divine light of the Godhead with the divine life of the Godhead. Thus, God is not only eternal light and life, but he shares himself the same light and life in measure with us to the degree that we ourselves become light and life too, for Christ then becomes all and in all, as St. Paul writes to the Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. So what then does all this have to do with the term eclipse, eclipsis? St. John the theologian is clear that the divine light, like its source, is unconquerable by anyone or anything, let alone darkness, which is not a force to be reckoned with in the dualistic sense, but rather is the very rejection of God and the light he shines over the world. As we read in John chapter 1, verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Rather than speaking of the absence of God from any particular space or time which is impossible, one can instead refer to the anomaly of voluntarily absenting oneself from the presence of God. God can never be absent from us, but we can certainly be absent from God. Nothing can hinder the divine light from shining anywhere, for no power surpasses the Holy Trinity. But whether or not this illumination from the heavens proves effectual for us depends upon whether we ourselves have arranged for this light to be eclipsed from our view. How does one eclipse the light of God? Much the same way the moon eclipses the sun by having something pass in front of it. As a satellite, the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it is also 400 times closer to the earth than the sun, making it appear greater in size, but not necessarily as brilliant. It is often the case, is it not, that our problems, our concerns, our worries, our worst fears appear insurmountable. To be sure, they are real, and they do appear so ominous that in our minds they seem to replace the reality of the brilliance and providence and wisdom of God. How often do we find ourselves exchanging the one true reality of the omnipotent and omniscient God for the false reality of evil, paying more attention to the seemingly larger moon, larger because of its proximity to us, rather than to the ever more dazzling sun. Our spiritual vantage point, if you will, makes all the difference. During a spiritual eclipse, we allow our problems to rule us and to direct our thoughts and emotions. 
does this not occur when we lose touch with the reality of God, when in our vulnerable and weak state, we forget that the sun's light can never be blocked out, that our darkness is all but temporary, just like any solar eclipse? Oftentimes, the demonic forces, whose realm runs parallel to our world and often interpenetrates our own material creation, suggest lies that are as vivid and attractive to us as any enticing pleasure. Fleeting joys and false securities appear closer to us than the unattractive, narrow way of the cross, dazzling us with their elegance and dwarfing promises of eternal life and peace with the immediacy of their lure. When the truth is abandoned and one's patience is surrendered, one begins to live the great lie. However, this lie is eventually exposed when the eclipse is over. The spiritual eclipse ends when in faith the truth is embraced meaning that one acknowledges the spectacular brilliance of the sun and the moon is proven to be but a temporary hindrance in the sun's course to commune with the world and provide its light in order to give us life. In this critical awakening of the mind and soul, we realign ourselves with God and once again become recipients of divine light and life, communicants of Christ, no longer prone to dark illusions that can only wield as much power over us as we allow them. As we said at the beginning, the term eclipse implies a deprivation, a lack, or an absence of some sort. It can mean to fail or to die, to be wanting or to abandon. Ultimately, it is never Christ who withdraws himself from us. It is we who deprive ourselves from him by falling prey to wrong thinking, by overreacting, and by accepting the demonic illusions that flirt with our minds and passing them as reality. The sun does not eclipse other celestial bodies. Rather, it is eclipsed itself, making the perpetrating agent appear greater and more powerful. Ultimately, it is a matter of perspective. How close are we to the light, and how close have we allowed the temptations and the difficulties, the moon, to approach us? The eyes of faith in the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ reveal the fullness of God's truth. The eyes of one's face reveal an altered reality and perhaps a relative truth that possesses, ultimately, an expiration date. I close with this one thought. Our absence from the light of God may place us in dark places throughout our lives. However, this does not disqualify the fact that the illumination we received at baptism remains deeply ingrained within us. I would remark that the entirety of our life in Christ is one long struggle to discover the light of the Holy Spirit within us and to remain connected with God, which habitual sin and forgetfulness, like overweight luggage pressing down upon our souls, have overwhelmingly buried this light deep inside of us. Removing such burdens allows the glorious light to envelop our very being to arrive at our hearts and minds with the message that we belong to God, that we have inestimable value, that God loves us unconditionally with no exceptions, and that we are ultimately greater than our problems, because God has joined us to deal with them and to eventually lift all burdens from our shoulders. Our spiritual eclipses are temporary because the light of Christ illumines all. Darkness is temporary. Death is temporary. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, is risen. Light has dawned. Death 
has been despoiled. Attaining divine victory is ultimately a matter of our being present in God, looking beyond the eclipse to see the glory that we share with the Blessed Trinity. Thank you for listening. Tell your friends to share my YouTube channel at FRDRSSM2024. A blessed week to you all and a blessed continuation of the Great and Holy Fast. Bye for now.